Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you, Carlos. Very kind of you to invite me to this uh, webinar. It's a great pleasure for me to talk to the British people because uh, I had all my foundation done in uh, London and Glasgow, and I feel very much uh, in that place. And talking about the Dista Rena joint is uh, something very, very hard, very close to my heart. And this is the evolution of my way with the Dista Rena joint. Really, <clears throat> I need to tell you that uh, to all the participants that I am part owner of the Aptis Medical LLC. So whatever I think I tell you, take it with a pinch of salt. But very early, we realized that uh, the literature was wrong regarding the ligament of the distal joint. And we found that uh, we could reconstruct the uh, dorsal ligament for dorsal instability and the palma ligament for palma instability. And it was not the other way around. And we published that, uh, the case that we have from 88 to 91 uh, in 1994. Uh, we also uh, had very really fun, I mean, at that time since 1989, on a shortening, because I think Milch was a genius. He didn't go ahead and amputate the, the head of the ulna like many people did. He saved uh, a young uh, man, this uh, that joint by uh, taking a cuff of the ulna. And that was the first ulna shortening done. And I thought that was amazing what he did. And then everybody uh, started doing uh, ulna shortening. We found that was very good for post-traumatic arthritis and early instability. And as, of course, for ulna abutment syndrome. The result that we have, we try to publish the, how good it was to preserve the joint, how good it was to have a joint with ligament reconstruction of ulna shortening instead of having an amputation of the head of the ulna. But the many advisors and reviewers from the Journal of Hand Surgery in, in, in Britain and in the United States thought that why to do this sort of thing when we had data, et cetera, et cetera. Well, uh, <laughs> the Australian were kind enough to publish that, and that was published in the Australian Journal. We had the opportunity in Ruivo because we have Bob Ackland, who was uh, the most uh, scientific human being in regarding to anatomy, and we had the most uh, fantastic lab, and with uh, the help with uh, Miss Lees, that is now a big professor in Manchester. We did some of the work uh, of the of the forearm, and we find out that uh, the literature is once again wrong because they talk, say that there are three elbow flexions in the uh, in the elbow, but it's only really one, the brachialis anterior that insert distal to the uh, uh, coronoid process of the ulna is the only elbow flex. So brachialis is no voluntary muscle, and the bicep is a flexor after after uh, is, uh, is supinate the forearm. We try to uh, show the axis of forces, how everything passes, and we did some work with text scan, but were rejected because we were introducing foreign material inside the joint. Thank goodness that Ms. Lynch was so persistent and she managed to have with a lot of his, uh, with her uh, trainees to do the same work uh, that we started in Louisville and did it with some gadgets from outside. Uh, but at the end, we also introduced TechScan and have fantastic results from those cases. Well, unfortunately today, still many people doing uh, direct procedures and so the Kapanji and uh, even wide excision of the ulna. We find out that if the head of the ulna is removed there's going to be impingement. And most of you have read about this already. I'm just, because of part of the, the talk, I mentioned it again. So, uh, so I was evolving in the treatment of this terrain I joined. We had a fantastic human being. It was a purple heart uh, from the Korean and Vietnam War. It, Veteran, and uh, he had a hand grenade that exploded on his right arm, and 
he couldn't do much. They did the best to fuse everything and try to take the pain away because everything is stable, unstable, the joint destroyed. And he came for help. But during my training, I read very disturbing papers. Papers that you didn't think of that before. One from Luther Smith and family. And what did they find out? Well, they find out that the sigmoid notch was not oriented the same way to everybody. So, wow, what a big problem now for us that we're doing on a short thing. And then a little bit later, about three years later, came another paper that, uh, that make you think a lot. It was a paper at Tola, Stanley and Trail. They find out that the sigmoid notch is not the same for everybody, they are different shades. Well, apart from that, apart from those two papers that uh, uh, shake me up a little bit about my way of thinking, uh, we all are different. We all look different. And we are human, but we are, look different. And so are our joints. Our joints change in some shape and also sizes. So we cannot have one, one element of the joint to fix everything. So we thought, that the only way we can help individuals who have problems with this renal joint was to replace the three part of the joint very much like Chanley did with the, the hip. He replaced the cup, he replaced the, the, the ball. So we added now the ligament. Because in that way, we hope that by replacing the sigmoid notch with the plate, replacing the ulna head with the stem and the ultra high molecular polyethylene ball, and replacing the TSC with a cover and a locking pin, we could have an intrinsic stability that will allow pronation supination, that we have radial migration, changing angle of rotation, but the most important thing, weight lifting capacity. And this is our first implant. We were not together, but we decided to put a plate with a box that in case 100% that ultra high molecular polyethylene ball, and we have an ulna stem that we hammered there. Uh, it's a three millimeter in diameter, and it was three point uh, fixation. Well, uh, the patient was happy. He got the big trunk and brought me those pictures taken by his wife while he was caught in the trunk. And worse than that, he was lifted with the right hand, that is bent the left hand, and, and lifting with that particular joint where he couldn't do anything. When I reprimand him, say, listen, uh, this joint is not for that. He said, you told me that this is a modular implant that you can change whatever that failed. So I realized that you need to be careful what you tell the patient because they take everything you, tell, you say and they apply to, to, their, the, to their benefit. Well, <clears throat> this is uh, funny. We tried to show the first 31 patient we had and we sent that to be published where David Elliott was the editor. And he called me and said, Louis, we have some problem because some people think that uh, what is the need for that when we have a data procedure? Indeed, one, one of the reviewers asked me if I, you ever heard of the data procedure. And I say, but tell me the name so I could invite him for a debate. I say, no, we cannot do that. But that was the opinion. The problem is that you have individuals that finish their training and stop there. The hand, the, the head never evolved and they didn't go with time. And we need to change all the time because uh, our specialty have been improving continuously. One day, this talk is going to be uh, very obsolete one day at the moment. I don't know it is, but it will be eventually. So this is a implant today. It has the five elements to the left, the, uh, the assemble, uh, assemble uh, to the right. And I want to show you a few cases demonstrating the use and why other implant couldn't be used to solve the problem in this individual. The first is this patient that hang in with very severe shoulder pain. And the shoulder pain came because she had a radio kappa fusion and her radio ulna fusion. So to pronate and supination, she had to use the shoulder to turn the hand in pronation and supination. Well, uh, but she came just 23 years after the fusion. She came 2011. We told her that we could take down what she had there and she couldn't believe it. But I said, yes, we can do that. We can uh, 
put something there to help. So we took everything down. This is a four year follow up on her. But when she came to see us after the surgery, she was ill. She could mate and supinate and have no pain in the shoulder any longer. Some of the cases, it's a fail. Uh, uh, Achilles tendon interposition in the Madelon deformity. Uh, in this case, we have no sigmoid because the Madelon deformity, the, the sigmoid notch doesn't develop. There was therefore no stabilizing uh, ligament for the for the uh, radius. And then in this particular case, the ulna was shortened with uh, the end of it looking like a pencil tip. We remove the tendon that was doing no good. We place uh, our implant between the on anchors. And two weeks later, she came for follow-up, everything doing fine. And four years after the, the surgery, she sent me this from home telling me how they, they was playing golf, that she had no problem, playing golf, playing tennis, playing basketball with the grandchildren, and back to work doing absolutely everything. What about what excision or the ulna? And some patient be helped with, uh, with these cases. This particular case started with the data procedure, but they couldn't find where the pain was. So uh, we did the test and we found that here, the pain is there. Thing is just when the two bones collide each other. When there is impingement, bone touching bone without cartilage, in the majority of the cases, it's going to produce pain. So we have to have an especially made ulna stem with a very long collar, extended uh, collar, so that we can restore the integrity of the low distributing system of the forearm. The patient did very well, and he managed to do absolutely everything back to work being able to lift weight in pronation, supination, neutral, and pulling and push with no problem whatsoever. Now, because we are hand surgeons, we are very, very inventive. And this is a case of uh, Sobeka Panji and wide excision of the ulna combined. It's a marriage of techniques. And for that, I blame the surgeon for thinking about this sort of thing. But, for this one, I blame the patient. How is it that you're going to go to someone that did an operation, didn't work, and come back to have the other hand, and not only had to have uh, a, 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 some anchor, you can see the, the, the bone anchor try to stabilize things, and have a, bone, a, a, a stimulator there, an electrical stimulator, to see if they could control the pain that she had in the, in the arm. So what I had to do for her was to remove that bone that never healed, Place those uh, for, uh, the, the, the distal uh, end of the ulna, the, the bridge, the gap of those cases, and the right has to be a little bit longer than the left. The patient was happy because she could lift weight in neutral pronation, supination, go back to work, and teach uh, once again, go back as a teacher with no problem whatsoever. Well, we all in our profession have seen the Jackson syndrome. And the von Jackson syndrome will come because the carpus and the radius don't like each other in rheumatoid patients. They fight each other and grind each other to, to death. Well, by doing that, that grinding makes sure that the sigmoid notch disappears. If the sigmoid notch disappears, there's no TFC. If there's no TFC, there's no support for the radius. And the radius fall palmally. And the radius fall palmally, the ulna look dominant, but the ulna is not unstable. The ulna is the stable part of the forearm, but the radius is falling palmally with a uh, ulna head depleted from cartilage, and then the tendon are being uh, shaved little bit by little bit as the, the patient flexes and extends the fingers, it's starting with the tensor of the quinti and moving to the middle. In these cases, what we need to do is to stabilize the radius by putting a so that now the hand and the radio are again connected to the distal ulna. Reconstruct the extensor tendon, put the extensor of rigor the day after surgery. And this is the patient six weeks after surgery, uh, back at work. And you can see the right hand have the scar uh, <clears throat> in, in the dorsum and the finger are extending the same as the hand in the, the non-operated hand. 
I would like to say that this is my case, but it's not. It's Dr. Miguel Pirela Cruz from, uh, at that time he was in El Paso, Texas, a very good friend. He gave me all these pictures of this patient with a six centimeter long uh, giant cell tumor. He had to resect seven centimeters from the tip to one centimeter proximal to avoid uh, recurrence of the tumor. We didn't have at that time very long stem where still we have only allowed to have of the shell the, the four centimeters. So we had to have the, the owner stem a little bit out. There was no problem. Uh, he did the surgery, a patient uh, started using the hand immediately after surgery. And two weeks after that, he went back to, to his regular activity. Um, and this is a good solution for, because in the past we used to take a fibula head and put in there, but they didn't have really a rear joint look like. Uh, at that time we were x-ray surgeons. Now we take care of the patient themselves. And this is most interesting. I got a call from this individual who say, uh, <clears throat> Louis, I need an implant. I say, yes, give me the number. I send it one overnight, tell me the size. I say, no, 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 no. I need an implant myself. Say, what? And this is uh, his x-ray, and that is in during surgery. We had to shave uh, the radius, take the, the lip of the, of the sigmoid notch, the polar lip of the sigmoid notch. You can see how the, the on the head was all destroyed. And we put on him <clears throat> the, the hand with the tendon graft, cross everything, and he came back to see him three months after surgery. I hope that you can hear this. I'm an orthopedic hand surgeon. Yeah. I'll have to do that. I was building a treehouse for my kids mm -hmm. and I accidentally cut myself with a chop saw. Pretty much stem to stern. Oh, no. Whose idea of that of, of having an implant put in there? Mine. How long ago is since we put a, the implant there? Approximately three months. Three months. And are you back to work? I went back to work at four weeks. No kidding. <laughs> Well, I didn't do much, but I did a little bit at four weeks. In my six weeks, I was doing full schedule. Full schedule. Yeah. No. With a pound. Yeah. Now, now I'm getting my disuse. Now you're going to see how weak I am. That's right. And even twenty pound Yeah. You know what? I wish I was strong as you are. I wish I was strong as I used to be. I can function. I can work. I really. I got my arm back again. We had the opportunity to have those cases, uh, uh, those patients that were done below the age of 40 years of age. We have patients between 18 and 39 years of age with an average of age 32. And they all had very good results, especially in grip, lifting, dash, PRWE, and pain and supination, not so much in pronation, a statistically significant improvement. We found that in those individuals that have surgery without previous procedure, the pain solved much better than those who had many procedures before. And the patient had a manual work, lifting capacity was much better than those that have a desk job. We have also taken care of patients will fail for the implant. Why do they fail? Well, they fail because it's impossible to secure the TFC to the end of the, of the implant, the unipolar implant, or because the stem is too short and too narrow, or because the bone is eroded by the, by the metal or the ceramic. This is a case of a 78 years old woodworker uh, done fantastic work, uh, uh, good working. And uh, the patient had three attempts to stabilize the so called stability sigmoid notch or FBI now striker. And the three attempts failed. So the patient came to see us and we told them that we could take this one out and replace by a semi constrained implant. But if you read the work of uh, McKee and Richard, they say, that sure, there is conversion uh, in that procedure, but not associated with a poor outcome because patients have full rotation. Well, full rotation is like wind pain. 
you can you can pronate, you can rotate the hand, but you cannot lift anything. So how good is that? Is the work that of the vein going around with the air? The worst thing that they say is the other patient with pain and stiffness in the distal radial joint uh, are the candidate for that. Do me a favor, do me a favor. All of you, raise your hand, all of you that can do the steeple chase. I don't see many hands. Well, look at these guys. Those are the category of 75 to 79 years old competing in a steeple chase. So really, how many years uh, do you have to do to be inactive? How, when do we have low demand for our joint? When do we need to clean ourselves or get dressed or just eat? Well, we didn't pay attention to that particular with the old implant out, put a new one. Patient came to see us six weeks after surgery. We didn't have the beautiful dumbbell with a way for patient to show us what he could do because he was very far office. We asked him, can you uh, pronate and supinate? It was equal to his hand. And then we asked, can you lift anything? And he was very kind to, to uh, fly. He said, look, with the hand, he lifted the, the tool, uh, the sitting tool. So he was very happy, went back to do his activity, his passion, woodworking, very fine work. So really, what I think that we need to do for this individual is to try to mitigate their pain, but never ever try to make them handicap. Because many of the procedures that have been dictated by this area joint made the people handicap rather than solving the problem. And one of these cases, when are you too old? This is an 84 years old complaining that he couldn't do his garden work. He couldn't pull the weed in the garden. And we thought that STT was involved. So we injected one CC or local setting STT, say no, it didn't change, the pain is still there. So we went ahead and injected the distal area joint, say, hey, the pain is gone. Can I? I said, well, unfortunately, we need to replace the joint. So we did. This is a view in the, uh, the, uh, the arm, the operating room. And this is the patient two weeks after surgery. You can see that still the stitches are in the arrow, show the stitches in place. And he went back to do everything he wanted, the happiest individual, uh, just by replacing one joint. The indication for this operation is general anomalies after tumor resection, degenerative, rheumatoid, and post-traumatic arthritis, savage procedure that have failed, or other implant that have failed. We had 386 prostheses that we did, and the patient regained about close to 90% of range of motion uh, and close to 70% of the strength. This number are very good. Look at that, the preoperative pain was 4.3 and went down to 1.1. The DASH score moved from 53 to 31.7. The previous evaluation by the patient, 68 to 33. The strength is important. The grip strength improved 100%, but lifting capacity improved by 500%. We have some complications. The complication came because initially we didn't have, we didn't take enough on that. We put a stem at the flare in many of those cases, and bone marrow escaping to the side, and then produce ectopic uh, calcification. Well, we also didn't check very well the length of the screw because we didn't have an oblique view of the radius. Remember, the radius tend to be curved on top and flat in the, in the Ebola aspect. And when you have an X-ray, what you are seeing is the screw is protruding from the Ebola aspect. And that is about three to four millimeters from where the, the screws are perforating the radius. We have infection to staphylococcus epididymis, and then we are using plastic to protect the, the area. We have infection, I might say, people who do gentlemen who inject in his cell. Some tendinitis were uh, 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 taken care of by putting lipoderma graft and also releasing the extensor carpionaris. And some allergies to nickel, the people that had no use uh, cheap jewelry before, but also we have allergy to cobochrome, and there's no way you can prove this one unless you put a metal, uh, a metal cobochrome in case the patient in the skin, and hopefully that will show if it is allergic or not. We also have 
two fractures, and those fractures were patients that fell uh, after doing things that they shouldn't be doing and broke the, the, the radius proximal to the, to the plate. And we had to put a, 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 a some fixation plate for these cases. <clears throat> Application have been reported very high by the people in, in uh, uh, Seattle and very low by uh, Han Kronberg from Odense University in Denmark. The complications mainly are related to who is doing the surgery, how much he does and how much attention he pay to the step-by-step -step as it is uh, proposed in the, in the manual. Because uh, if you follow step-by-step, -step, you are going to have less problem. For that reason, we uh, recommend uh, you said if you decide one day to use this our, our implant to send x-ray, graded x-ray, so we can see where the implant uh, need to be placed. Then take the whole length of the forearm because there's sometimes the curvature in the ulna and we need to analyze those. And we need to see how it, everything works. This is a patient with just a uh, ulna head excision. This is a patient with a uh, sobekapangi, and this is a patient with a different implant uh, to be removed and replaced. Well, uh, the surgery is very simple. The surgery is done to a hockey stick incision, and we elevate a subcutaneous tissue. We place a plastic protection there. We elevate the skin from the from the deep fascia, and then create a, fas a, a fascia flap to, to put between the implant and the stencil capionaris, uh, four by four centimeter in, in length on the base. Then we release the stencil capior, the stencil capionaris, because there will be no subluxation as the motion is now going to be inside the joint and the hand and the radius are going to rotate together with tensile capionaris. Then in that way, we have no uh, tethering or pressure on the implant. We got the ulna uh, about two centimeters distance of the ulna, so that allows to depress the ulna and be able to see the sigmoid notch and do the debris and cling of the sigmoid notch and the ulna side of the radius. Then after we do that, we need to make sure that we take the whole leap of the sigmoid notch that is the most prominent in those cases and tend to tilt, as you can see in the middle, they tend to tilt the implant uh, dorsally. And that, that's not a very good one. The, the bottom one show how the implant should be after you res resect the volar leap of the, of the sigmoid notch. That allows also to the implant to be moved dorsally or palmally and also allow this uh, proximal motion of the, of, the red, of the plate. And <clears throat> here the procedure, we uh, put a trial plate uh, with two K wires, and then the most important thing, don't throw your eyes because we are operating from an angle. Throws the image intensifier, and then you have an AP and a lateral with the image intensifier. You see, I like the AP here, but the lateral don't like because it's a little bit too dorsal. So we had to correct that and we did that in this particular case. And after we uh, are happy, we put in a screw, compression screw there in the tri plate. And then after the compression screw is fixing everything, then we put uh, a drill bit for the uh, radial peg, leaving in position. Now we go again to the image intensifier, we see how everything is in position. The screw is very long because we don't want to damage the distal cortex. So we wanted to pass all the way that uh, it compress the plate against the, against the radius. And as you can see on the lateral view, how we had to move the hole to the center so that it was in a much better place for the implant. Now we like this one, we go ahead and replace the right plate by the permanent plate. We put the, the uh, screw again, the two uh, locking uh, screws, initially approximate, approximate screw only unicortical. Then we take the compression screw out, replace it with a locking screw. And now it's time to, uh, to pay attention to the ulna. We uh, check, before we do the anything, we check that the screws are what we want. That screw distally is protruding. 
to the dorsum or the radius. So that is why we need to be careful where uh, the screws are, because you put it too long, it's going to be touching the soft tissue on the other side. So now we are happy with the, the, the reference, uh, cutting, reference uh, cutting device uh, with a black ball for the number 10 and number 20 implant and number uh, blue for the number 30, that's a large one for, for big, big uh, people that are doing heavy work. And then we mark. If we are going to cut, uh, it's better to cut proximal to the mark than distant to the mark because we can leave the implant uh, the stem a little bit prominent, but it's difficult to do if you take it, if you don't uh, cut it enough. And after that, what is needed to be cut, put a guy wire all the way, introduce it all the way you can, all the, all the way you can perforate the cortex. And then introduce the belt, starting from the small one. Uh, and increasing until you find some chask so you feel that you are touching the cortex on both sides. And then it, it should go all the way to the, to the black mark. Take the everything out, take the guy wire out, and introduce the rima to touch the distal end of the owner. And once that is done, then we irrigate as much as we can, uh, make sure that everything is dry once again, and open the, uh, the stem from the part of the insert. Don't open it from the sharp, uh, from the polish area, sharp, uh, open from the area that going to be inserted. So we can start with the envelope, uh, the pouch to introduce it into position and then continue tapping. But don't do too much. Check after you have, you are about two to three millimeter from the, the shining part touching the owner, check if the ball will go into the socket. If not, you do, did that happen? In this particular case, we did very good cut. We uh, went ahead, polished, uh, put a, the, the peg, the, the ball at the end. The ball, we pressed the ball uh, against the, the plate with the thumb and then put the cover. The cover should glide with no forces whatsoever. Then uh, the distal end of the cover is smaller, the proximal end is wider. So we introduce it to the flanges that the prosthesis had to the side, push with the thumb now and make sure that everything is in, in, in alignment. And start putting this one with our finger because we have proprioceptic information that way. And then after we start the screw uh, with the finger, we are happy that it's going like butter, in, 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 like a hot, uh, knife in butter. Then. Uh, finish by putting everything, you know how to tighten to as one is flush, that's it. Now we can check range of motion, make sure that everything looks good. Create image intensify, rotate all around, make sure that everything looks good. At this point, we put the, the, the flap that we created before, we put on top of the implant and take the tourniquet down, make sure that we have good hemostasis and then close in any way we want. So with this wing, <laughs> we have finished the operation. One of the advantages of this implant is you don't have to mobilize anything. You allow the patient to start using the hand the day after surgery or once the anesthetic has worn off. The most important thing is try to say the uh, joint by, by respecting the head or the red or the, or the ulna by respecting the sigmoid notch, when you have a fracture distal radio, no. Don't concentrate just on the, on the radio kappa joint. The radio ulna joint is more important. If you have ligam, ligament uh, problem, take care of that early. And when nothing can be done, you need to put something to replace the joint. This implant or anything you feel like, so thank you very much to all of you. I saw a lot of friends in the list. Some of them said hello and hello to you as well. Uh, and I'm going to stop here.